Well, hey there, guys, and welcome to the Sunday edition of Mailbag. My name is John Campia. As I explained on Mailbag yesterday, you know, the entire Collider crew, including myself, is on vacation. Uh, I'm actually recording this on Friday. Um, and But, you know, I just thought... Despite the fact that the production value will be terrible, we don't have all the fancy graphics, we don't have proper audio or a proper video camera, I thought I would do mailbag anyway because we haven't had movie talk all week and we thought we would do it this way. Also, if you want to get a question on mailbag, either the mailbag segment on movie talk or the weekend mailbag shows, you can usually email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. That's where we normally get all the questions. But just for this weekend, I thought I would do something a little bit different. And I put out a Facebook post on my Facebook page, which, by the way, you can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter at, at John Campia. Uh, that's where you can find me on Twitter and on Facebook. And I just asked people to leave questions in there so it would be easy for me just to read them off on a big list right here. So that's the way I did it. And uh, yesterday, I think I got through like 30 questions. I'm going to try to get through 30 or 40 questions here today. So without any further ado, and all apologies given for the bad production value and all that kind of stuff, Let's jump into it. And the first question today comes from Truman Hardwood, who writes, what is your most anticipated comic book movie of 2017? You know, on yesterday's show, somebody asked me, um, am I, what, you know, what am I most excited for? And it's Wonder Woman. It's still Wonder Woman. Uh, you know, they asked if I would prefer it over Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I have a feeling Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is going to be the better film. But there's a lot cool, more cooler things. Like there's a big question mark over Wonder Woman, and that's exciting because it's the first DC movie we're going to see that isn't directed by Zack Snyder, that first modern DC film with the new DC universe. And I'm really curious to see how this is going to turn out. It's the first in the modern comic book era. It's the first female-led superhero film. It's Wonder Woman, for heaven's sakes. So that's the one I'm most excited about. I mean, I still have my reservations and my questions about Gal Gadot because I... I just don't think she's that good of an actress yet. Um, but hey, let's see what she does with it. She's been working at this character now for a couple of years. And I'm excited for it. I am. So let's see what let's see what happens. My number one most anticipated, I'm not saying it's going to be the best, but my most anticipated comic book film of 2017 is Wonder Woman. All right, Christian Lomas. And by the way, I'm going to try to fly through these questions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any single one. Christian Lomas writes, do you think Mark Wahlberg and Peter Berg are one of the best actor-director duos in, in the business today? Lone Survivor is amazing, and Deepwater Horizon was one of my favorites of the year, and I've been hearing Patriot's Day is even better. You know what? Two years ago, that would have been a joke. Mark Wahlberg and Peter Berg is the best writer-director or uh, director-actor combo in Hollywood. It ain't a joke no more. Now, look, I still give that title to Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. And they haven't done one together now for a couple of years, but I, I still say that title belongs to Scorsese and DiCaprio. But look, Deepwater Horizon really surprised me how, about how good it is. I really enjoyed Deepwater Horizon. I thought it was great. I think Patriot's Day is even better than Deepwater Horizon. It is also great. Um, these two guys... Um, they have found some magic in each other. I mean, Berg just knows how to bring the best out of Wahlberg. And Wahlberg just happens to be that performer that Berg can really shape to tell his story. And look, what might have been a joke two years ago is now no joke. I am now going to be very excited to hear about what's Mark Wahlberg and Peter Berg going to do together next. Uh, especially this year with Deepwater Horizon and Patriot's Day in the same year. I mean, crazy good stuff. So keep your eye open on this tandem move forward. It is possible. It is possible they could dethrone Scorsese DiCaprio. They could do it. I'm not saying they will. I'm just saying don't count it out because they are on a roll right now together. Let's see what the future holds. All right. Next question comes from Riley Johnson. Why aren't video game movies any good? Yeah, that piece of crap. Um, Assassin's Creed just came out. Awful, awful film. Um, so disappointed. I was so excited for that movie. Look, I'll, I'll go back to what I said about comp about video game movies the whole time. Video games are not made for storytelling. They do tell stories, but their primary function, and this is the way it should be, video games' primary function is to make for a ga great gameplay experience not a great storytelling experience. And when you can weave decent story into the game, that makes the game experience even better. But I've been saying that for years. And everybody, no, John, video games tell the best stories. Sorry, 
You're 0 for 40. You're 0 for 40. Um, at some point, at some point, you know what this reminds me of? Here's what this reminds me of. It reminds me of that girl. We all know this girl. That girl, it could be a guy. It doesn't matter. For, for arguments, okay, let's say guy. It's, let's say it's, it's this guy, okay? And he dates a girl and turns out she was, she was just a horrible person. She was a jerk. Then he dates another girl and she's a jerk. So breaks up. Then he dates another girl. She's a jerk. So they broke up. Then he dates another girl. She was a jerk and they broke up. Then he dates another girl. She's a jerk. They broke up. Then he dates another girl. Blah, 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 blah. And he goes through 40 girls. And he says, all of them ended up being jerks. Maybe you buy that. Maybe you buy that for the first two or three or maybe even four. But at some point, the issue, you got to ask the question, hey, dude, the common denominator in all 40 of those failed relationships was you. You're the common denominator. Maybe the problem ain't all those girls. Maybe, maybe the problem is you. And for, for years, uh, people, whenever I say, look, the basic problem here is that video games are not designed to be movies. They're designed for gameplay. They're not designed for storytelling, even though some of them have some very good storytelling in them. They're not designed for that. And people say, no, John, no, that's not it. Well, guess what? You're 0 for 40. You're 0 for 40. At some point, the problem isn't that studio or that studio or that studio or that studio or that studio. At some point, the problem isn't that director or that director or that director or that director. At some point, the problem is the common denominator. And when you're 0 for 40, that common denominator is the genre itself has an inherent weakness in that it's, they're not designed to be movies in the first place. Now, that is not to say that we can't get a great one, um, we can, it is possible, of course it's possible. But at some point, we're just gonna have to admit that video games were meant to be games and be awesome at being games. They weren't meant to be movies. If they were meant to be movies, they would have been movies. And that's not to say, I'm not suggesting, before people try to twist my words, I'm not suggesting Hollywood should give up on the idea of making a video game movie. I'm not suggesting that it'll never happen. I do believe it will happen. The odds, I mean, the rule of, of, of you know probability says at some point we got to get a great one. I thought Warcraft was going to be that. And I liked Warcraft, but it wasn't the great one. I thought Assassin's Creed was going to be it next. Nope, that thing ended up being a bag of shit. And now we're looking forward to films like maybe Metal Gear or, or maybe Last of Us or maybe, um, you know, Drake, you know, uh, Nathan Drake movie, Uncharted. Maybe that'll be the next. I, I don't know. But at some point, we just got to say after 40 attempts and 40 fails, maybe the problem is the video game genre itself. I mean, so anyway, that's why I think video game movies haven't worked up to this point. And it's going to be an uphill battle for video game movies going first. But believe me, I'm going to be the first one to pop a bottle of champagne when that maybe it'll be Uncharted. Maybe it'll be Last of Us. Maybe it'll be um, any one of a uh, you know, hundred other games. Maybe a Battlefront movie. Maybe, uh, who knows? Maybe a Call of Duty movie will do it. Who knows? At some point, a great one's going to come, and I'll be the first one to pop a bottle of champagne when it does. I'm just saying the odds are stacked against it at this point, and at some point, you got to ask, maybe the problem isn't the studios, maybe the problem isn't the directors, maybe the problem isn't the writers, maybe at some point, just like that guy who goes through 40 failed relationships, you got to say, dude, you're the common denominator, therefore, you're the problem, and maybe just the idea of the genre is the problem at this point. I don't know. It's just after 0 for 40, it's tough. All right, uh, Armando Garcia writes, any tips on people trying to do their own novels? Tips on self-publishing, advertising. Don't worry about self-publishing, all that kind of stuff. Get the novel written. And the best advice I can give to anybody trying to write a novel is just write. Even if you think you're stuck and you've got no good ideas, write your bad ideas. And just keep writing, just keep writing, just keep writing, just keep writing. There's an old saying that's still very, very true. It's a very good thing. You can't steer a car that's sitting still. You can't steer a car that's, you can turn the wheel all you want, but you're still not getting anywhere. You can only steer a car once you're moving. And if all you got is bad ideas, who cares? Just start moving. 
Just start writing, just start writing, just start writing, get moving. And then once you're moving, maybe then you can find your way. So my best advice to anybody is just write and write and write and write and write and see what happens. All right, uh, next question comes from Kevin Riviera who writes, what's the future of face animation for dead actors? And do you think it's ethical or moral to keep doing it? And do you think actors are going to sign a petition not to do it when they die, Carrie Fisher, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> yeah, this has been coming up a lot when, you know, they did some digital remapping of Paul, on Paul Walker's brother's faces to make them look more like Paul Walker. We've obviously just seen that done a bunch in, um, in Rogue One. We saw them do young Magneto and Professor X in that X-Men movie. I believe it was X-Men 3 a few years ago. Um, do I think they'll do it a lot in the future? I don't think they'll do it a lot in the future. Do I think it's unethical? No, I don't think it's unethical as long as it's understood that, look, when, um, let's say, for example, let's say Leonardo DiCaprio uh, signs on for a, a, to play, I don't know, let's say Leonardo DiCaprio is going to be Gambit, all right? And I think what will have to happen, though, is that moving forward, studios are going to have to start considering this question and put that into their contracts and say, look, if we, if we hire you to be Gambit, we're taking a risk here because now we're saying you are the face of Gambit. So if we do more Gambit movies in the future and you tragically, if some, you, you have an accident, you pass away, we have to protect ourselves and say we have the right still to use your image for a certain period of time and that has to be in their, in their contract. But look, we are still a, a long ways away from being able to do a full movie with a digital face of somebody else on it. I mean, it's cool right now. You can still, you can do some scenes, but even people coming out of Rogue One are saying that looked kind of creepy. And it was, it's only for them standing very still. It's not action and it's not a lot of screen time. They haven't gotten this technology to the point. So, you know, people are saying, oh, now you, they could just do the, the Han Solo movie and just do a digital young Han Solo face. Yay. No, no, no. They're not at that point yet. You could maybe do a couple scenes where it's standing still. Remember Michael Douglas, they made him look a lot younger in the first scene of Ant-Man. But that was him basically standing very still, just moved in a little bit, blah, 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 blah. And it was only for a very short scene. And they can, they can pull that off, but even then it doesn't quite look right. To do an entire movie where they're moving and talking dynamics and they're, they're in scenes for like an hour instead of just for two minutes and all that kind of stuff, they're not there yet. They're still a ways away. However, moving forward, we are going to get to that point where that technology works. And I think that's just going to have to be something that studios and actors are going to have to work into their contracts. And studios are going to say, hey, look, that's cool. If we make you the face of this character, we have to be able to have the right to continue to use your face as the face of the character if something tragic happens to you. And then they're just going to have to negotiate that. And as long as they do that, I don't think there's anything unethical about it. I think it might be weird and kind of odd, uh, but I think somebody will try it and then it'll really be up to the audience as to whether or not we like it or not. And that'll be the, the big key factor. Uh, Freddy Orozco writes, besides Star Wars, what is the movie you watch the most times at a theater? If you take out all the Star Wars movies, probably the movie I went to go see most times in the theater was probably the first Thor movie. I actually went to go see it nine times in theater. Um, so yeah, probably the first Thor movie. Um, Kimberly, uh, Grocer writes, hi, John, uh, any ongoing pranks you guys have in the Collider office? There's not any ongoing pranks, but Josh McCuga will do pranks, um, once in a while. And he will even do a series of pranks now and again, then cap we've captured them on film and showed them on movie talk before. Um, Pretty much Josh McCuga is the office prankster. So most, there's not a lot of ongoing ones, but any pranks that get done, it's usually Josh McCuga that does them. Um, David Steely writes, what TV, series is, do you, do, what TV series do you follow? I don't follow a lot because I don't have a lot of time for TV. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not like, you know, McCuga who watches like, like McCuga is a TV fanatic, man. Um, where I, I don't watch like 40 shows, but uh, I, I watch Supernatural. I love Supernatural. I like The Flash. Uh, I've been getting into um, Designated Survivor. That one's pretty good. Um, what else is ongoing right now that's that's really good? I'm sure I watch a few more. Um, I don't watch a whole ton, but there are a few. Um, Fabrice Rapp writes, if we see Force Ghosts in Episode 8, 
Will they use CGI Alec Guinness or Ewan McGregor? And what are the chances of Hayden Christensen appearing as well in episode eight? I say 60%. I say 1% that Hayden Christensen appears in episode eight. Um, and if they do use Obi-Wan moving forward, it's going to be Ewan McGregor. I'm pretty positive that it's going to be Ewan McGregor that they're going to use moving forward. Uh, Ben Polkey writes, what has Gary Oldman been doing, uh, during 2016? I don't remember seeing him in anything this year and I'm a huge fan. Is there a reason for, for his seeming absence? Well, no, he, he was in that movie with Ryan Reynolds, um, this year. I no, no, no. Was Ryan Reynolds in it? Yeah, Ryan Reynolds and Kevin Costner called Criminal. Uh, so he was in that movie this year, and he's got four movies coming out in 2017. So most of 2016, he's been filming those movies coming out in 2017. So he's very active. He's got a lot of movies coming out. Don't worry about Gary Oldman. He's got a lot of stuff coming. But the, uh, the name of that movie was Criminal. Um Tyler Wonka Richardson writes, why do audiences find it okay when a comic book movie deviates from the source material, but they want book adaptations to be seen for seen? I think probably because book adaptations are much more fleshed out than comics. Um, and, 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 you know, even John Schnepp will tell you that. I mean, because a story in a novel is 600 pages. Uh, a lot of the story in, uh, in comic books is done very visually and, and more succinct. Um, they focus more in comic books, but also comic books have like how many Batman origin stories are there? How many Joker origin stories are there? How many different versions of Aquaman have we seen? How many different versions of, of Captain America have we seen? How many this, how many that? I mean, comic books retro their origins and their stories so many times or retcon their stuff so many times that at some point, I remember Brian Singer talking about um, uh, Superman Returns, the one with Brandon Routh. And somebody asked Brian, it was, this is a great question. Somebody asked Brian Singer, why did you change the Superman costume for the movie? And Brian Singer gave a brilliant answer. He says, which Superman costume? There have literally been 20, at that time, 23 iterations of the Superman costume in comic books up to this point. So when you say, why did you change the Superman um, costume? From which version are you talking about? I mean, and that's a great thing. So I think comic readers are more um, acclimated to the idea that the story changes because they change in the comics themselves uh, many times. I mean, some people say Superman never kills, but there are issues in the Superman that he does kill and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So um, I think there's just more of that. Whereas with the novel, it's the novel. The novel doesn't come out with a new version with a different ending. There is the novel and only the novel and it's completely fleshed out. It's like three to 600 pages long and therefore the um, the readers of those novels become a little more attached to the beat by beat details of that. Whereas comic book readers, they haven't just read one issue of Batman. That's it. I've read one issue of Batman and this issue of Batman, nothing ever changes in it. That's it. It's not like that for comic book readers. Comic book readers are more attuned and, and acclimated to the idea that the stories can change and the characters can change. Uh, we're just more used to that than say novel readers where the novel comes out and that's it. That's the novel and it's it forever. So I think that's one of the reasons why comic book fans are a little bit more flexible when it comes to movies taking liberties than say novel readers are about movies taking liberties. Even though filmmakers, I've said this before, I will say it again. The filmmaker's first responsibility is not to stay as true as possible to the source material. That's not the filmmaker's responsibility. The filmmaker's responsibility is to make the best movie possible, period. That's the responsibility. And if that means you stick to the source material, then stick to the source material. But if to make the best movie possible, you need to change the source material or make take liberties with the source material, then damn right you take liberties with the source material because your job is to make the best movie possible, not to stick as close as possible to the source material. That's the job of a filmmaker. All right, Nathan Taylor writes, would Clyder ever do a commentary for Die Hard? I doubt it. Um... We'll see. We'll see. I mean, we, we generally like to keep the commentaries to new released ones, things that a lot of people have in their collections right now. I mean, certainly Die Hard is one a lot of people have in their collections, but we generally try to stick to newer ones. But who knows? I mean, Die Hard's a possibility. Uh, Jonathan Rivera writes, question, what can DC do to change their, their reactionary ways regarding the DC Cinematic Universe? I don't want to go into a long rant on this. I'll just say this. Make a plan 
take your time making your plan. And then once you make your plan, stick to it. That's all. That's all they got to do. Um, tinkering with little things here and there is fine, all that kind of stuff. But make a plan. Take your time in making your plan. Don't go, you know what? On Saturday, think, let's do 15 movies. And we'll do on this date, this date, this date, this date. And then make an announcement the next day to the world when you haven't really thought it out. That's what DC has done. Um, they can fix it. They can fix it. And I'm, I'm hoping that they will. They got some smart people over there at Warner Brothers. And I'm trusting that they will. Uh, Richard Allen Haw writes, whatever happened to the Johnny Quest movie? Will it be based in the 60s and will Johnny uh, will Johnny be around 12? Um, the Johnny Quest movie is still in development. It is happening. Um, I, I happen to know the producer of the movie. I'm friends with the producer uh, and I know they're still working on it. I, it is coming. There is going to be a Johnny Quest movie. It's coming. Um, they've just, I think right now they're still working on unlocking in the director that they want. They had a director, but then unfortunately lost that director. And now they're just, and they've had a lot of directors show interest in it, but not quite the director they've wanted. They're just waiting to lock in that director that they really want. And then things will get moving. Uh, Riley Johnson writes, could they make an underdog? Could they make underdog into the next superhero movie property? No. Um, Ike Moore, uh, what's it been like leaving and coming back to Clyder all in one year? Um, up and down. I mean, I hated having to leave Collider uh, at the beginning of the year, but I had to. I, I I I can't go into all the details. I had to leave. Um. There were some personal reasons. There were some professional reasons I had, but I, I was in a position where I, I had to make the decision to leave. I didn't want to, but I needed to. Uh, I mean, and part of that, as I've expressed before, is that I had a lot of opportunities to do some things. Um, some things you do know about, like things like Film HQ and crap like that, but there are things that I was able to get involved in, and I'm still involved in to a degree that I cannot talk about because I'm under NDAs, um, that I never would have had the chance to. When they came back and asked me, when, when they came to me, when Complex came back to me and asked me to come back, um, you know, it, I mean, I'll be honest, I had to think about it because there were some other things that, that kind of were reasons why I left and those things had to be addressed. They were addressed and, you know, look, Collider Video and before that, AMC News, this is my baby. I mean, I created this thing. So I'm always going to be, I'm always going to love it. And I love the people that are here and involved with it. Especially, you know, Dennis and I go so far back and, you know, with Christian and Mark being involved and Schnepp, obviously, and everybody there. Um, it, it was, it was great coming back. I mean, I had to give up a, a few other things. I had to give up and stop doing a few things in order to come back. But, um, I was more than happy to come back and it's been great. And I, I got to thank you guys so much, the, the audience and the fans for supporting me both in my decision to leave, uh, at the beginning of the year and in me coming back. So I got to thank you guys so much for allowing that to happen. Um, but yeah, when they came back and, and asked me to come back, I, I, I couldn't say no. As long as the issues that I had got addressed, and they were, um, there was no way I was going to say no. Um, uh, Nuizet MH writes, would you be willing to expand on the Collider brand by creating a new show focused on independent films? Sasha Pro Raver has a little section in the Schmoes No Show, but I think you guys would, um, would be able to let your audience know about all sorts of movies. Well, here's the thing, uh, Nuizet, we used to do a show. A weekly show. I talked about it a little bit on yesterday's mailbag. We used to have a show before we came over to Collider. Was, this is back when we were still with AMC. And it was called AMC Indie Spotlight. And uh, it was run by uh, Amy Rose Eisenbach. She was kind of the head of it for a while. And then um, our Aussie, our favorite redheaded Aussie in the world, she, she took it over and did a great job with it as well. I loved Indie Spotlight. Um, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. The problem is we put a lot of effort and a lot of love into that show and nobody watched it. Nobody watched it. And unfortunately we are in the type of business where if people don't, we can't put money and time and resources into something if we don't get results, if we don't get people watching it. And unfortunately, the audience spoke and the audience said, we're not interested. Now there were some people that were interested and they were very loyal and they watched it, but the numbers were very, very bad. And as much as it broke my heart, um, 
we had to pull the plug on it. And so I'm not saying we'll never do something again that just explicitly focuses on independent film. All I'm saying is that we did try. We took a big swing of the, we invested a lot of money in it and a lot of time and a lot of energy and studio time and all that kind of crap. And nobody supported it. So it, it, it would be very difficult for me to say to green light another indie film show when number one, I don't think we can do it better um, than we did before. I don't think we can make it better than those girls did it, uh, than the one we already had. I thought that show was awesome. So we can't do it any better than the way we did it before and the audience didn't support it. So it leaves me in the sucky situation where it's like, I can't justify doing another indie movie show until more interest gets shown in it, and that might take a little while. But thank you for the question. Connor Dalton writes, do you reckon Nick Cage could ever make uh, make it back consistently into mainstream cinema? Absolutely he could. All it takes is one great role. If he does one great role, I'll tell you what, after Kick-Ass, he was close because everybody loved Nick Cage and Kick-Ass. Had he followed up Kick-Ass with another really good choice of a movie to do, I think we, he'd be back, um, and I still think he can. Look, there's a reason this guy's got a couple Oscars on his mantle. When he wants to be, he's world-class. He is great. Um, it just might take a little while. We'll see. It's possible. Will it happen? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I'm doubting it'll happen, but it's absolutely possible. Okay. Josh Mink writes, what celebrity is the most genuine person you've ever met? Um, I mentioned Milo Ventimiglia is great. I, I got to say Chris Pratt. I mean, look, I've met a lot of them that are super genuine um, and awesome people. Um, I mean, I could list off a huge ton of them, but Chris Pratt, um, I've had a number of occasions to get together with him. You know, he, he's come into the, to the Collider offices, uh, into our studio on a number of occasions. He's come in and hung out with us for an afternoon or whatever. And He's just awesome. Chris Pratt is as awesome and as genuine as, as it gets. And if he's not genuine, then he is the greatest actor that ever lived. Because holy crap, like every, like he's just so, he's wonderful. Chris Pratt is wonderful. Total bro crush on the dude. He's amazing. Uh, Reggie Phoenix writes, what are you most excited for, for? What are you most excited for? Kingsman, The Golden Circle, or John Wick 2? Hey, look, I love Kingsman. But John Wick's on another level. I, I, I am by far more excited. I'm super excited about Kingsman. Don't get me wrong. I am super excited about it. But John Wick 2 is on another level. That is the one I'm most excited about. And Jonathan Ross writes, thoughts on Jimmy Kimmel as the host of the Oscars. I was hoping to see someone a bit more unexpected who is not already on TV doing comedy every night. Look, I'll be honest with you. Everybody knows I would prefer the host of the Oscars to be a movie person, a legit movie personality. I was hoping for somebody like a Kevin Spacey um, or something like that. But you know what? I like Jimmy Kimmel. So let's give a shot. He's got to be better than Ellen DeGeneres. He's got to be better than James Franco was. He's got to be better than some of the swings they've taken lately. You know what? I think Jimmy Kimmel's going to do a good job. I really do. Um, and uh, let's see what happens. All right. Thomas Cook writes... What was the most disappointing movie of the year, in your opinion? Most disappointing movie of the year. Um, I've got a couple here that I jotted down. Disappointing movies of the year, Free State of Jones with Matthew McConaughey, because I thought that was going to be a best Oscar, a best picture Oscar contender. The movie was terrible. Assassin's Creed, I thought would finally be the movie to make a great video game movie, and it was a terrible, terrible train wreck. Girl on the Train was another movie I thought could have possibly been a best picture contender. Awful film. X-Men Apocalypse. I didn't hate X-Men Apocalypse, but considering how great X-Men Days of Future Past was, I was, I was expecting an Apocalypse. I've been waiting forever for Apocalypse. I was expecting super awesome, and it was not super awesome. And I'm a big Key & Peele fan. I love Key & Peele. So when Keanu was coming out, I had super high expectations with that. And honestly... I thought that one disappointed. I thought it was a big letdown. So those to me are the big disappointments of 2000. I'm not saying those are the worst films of 2016. I'm saying those are my most disappointing films of 2016. Um, okay, Jonathan Spiroff writes, for Denis Villeneuve's Dune, would you like to see some of the concepts and artwork from Jodowowski's Dune carry over or inspire parts of the film? I would love to have seen some of H.R. Geiger's artwork carry over. That didn't end up in Alien. Um... 
It all depends. It depends on what vision does Denis Villeneuve have. And if Denis Villeneuve has a vision that would not work with any of the artwork from Jodorowsky's Dune, then no, I don't want to see it force-fed in there. If it fits, then great. But it all depends on that movie. It's like a lot of people saying, hey, do you think Brian Cranston should play, play Lex Luthor? Well, I don't know, because I don't know what kind of Lex Luthor they're, they're writing. I mean, they could write one kind of Lex Luthor, which would be a perfect fit for Brian Cranston. But they could write another kind of Lex Luthor that, no, 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 Brian Cranston wouldn't be a good fit for that. So it really all depends. Thomas Cook writes, are you more excited for Wonder Woman or Justice League? Um, I'm excited, more excited for Wonder Woman. I'm excited for Justice League, but I'm more excited for Wonder Woman. Brian Foster writes, do you think Disney will come to their senses and put the opening crawl back into the non-episodic Star Wars movies as well as the iconic opening theme music? God, I hope so. Because I love Rogue One. I loved it. The lack of the opening crawl did not change my love for Rogue One, but it was jarring and it's a mistake. It is absolutely a mistake. Don't give me this BS. I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Don't give me this BS that, oh, taking out the opening crawl will make it different from the episodic movies. No, no. You've got an entire movie to make your movie different. This is Star Wars. Not having that opening score, not having an opening crawl. And you know, Christian Harloff made a great point to me. He said, you know what's funny? In retrospect, no Star Wars movie ever needed an opening crawl as much as Rogue One did. And I completely agree. Um, our opening crawl to set up that first scene about who is Orson Krennic, who is Galen Erso, who is Jin, why are they on this planet? A quick little opening crawl to do that would have felt good, felt right. Look, you put the opening crawl in the comic books for heavens, for fuck's sake. You put it in the comic books. I just opened up a Poe Dameron comic. Guess what? First page, an opening crawl. It's stupid. It's stupid. And it's it really frustrates me because the people at Lucasfilm are so much smarter than I am, especially um, when, you're, when you're talking about the likes of the people who really run this thing. They are geniuses, okay? Kathleen Kennedy is a genius. I love Kathleen Kennedy. She is awesome. And the way she has shepherded the Star Wars universe post-George Lucas has been nothing short of awesome. But even the best make mistakes. And the lack of an opening crawl and that Star Wars thing, because that opening title screen was terrible. The lack of an opening crawl was terrible. It was jarring. It felt out of place. It was a mistake. Please, Kathleen Kennedy, you are one of the smartest people in the business. You're way smarter than me. And even I, somebody far less smart as you, know that it was a tragic, horrible mistake not to put that in there. Fortunately, the movie's awesome. Made my top 10 best films of the year. Um, but please put it back. And I, I really hope they they smarten up. Um, Keith McBain writes, Little Hobo or Beachcombers movie? A little bit of Canadian television there. I love them both. Everywhere I go, I make a new friend. That's a little, little hobo. Anyway, the little hobo. Um, I would actually go Beachcombers. I think Beachcombers would make a pretty good movie. Uh, Zach Kocher Stubbs writes, Hey, John, do you think we will see any Robins in the DCEU? I don't think so, but it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Uh, Dan Risen writes, favorite film slash series to watch with family besides Star Wars. My mom is a major Lord of the Rings nut. I mean, my mom's also the one that got me into Star Wars. So I love watching Star Wars with her more than anything else. But my mom is a psychotic Lord of the Rings fan. She bought every version that Peter Jackson gouged out. Like this version, that version, this version, the extra special version, the super deluxe del director's version. My mom got all of them. I love watching Lord of the Rings with my family. Um, Mario Zakal writes, any planned commentaries that are coming up? We don't, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say we don't have any planned right now, but we are going to do one. Keep your ears open. We'll do one in January for sure. I just don't know which one yet, uh, but keep your ears, eyes and ears open for that. Okay. Just time for a couple more. Um, Courtney Libri writes, have you ever felt that leaning, uh, that learning more about how movies are made and shot lower your enjoyment of the movies? No, as a matter of fact, I remember when I got into visual effects and I worked in the visual effects industry for a while, really learning how visual effects are done and how lighting is done and how things are shot, it, if nothing else, it has made me appreciate the art of film more. I think the more you learn about the art of movie making, the more you will appreciate and enjoy good filmmaking. Um, I think it'll just really enhance your, your uh, enjoyment of it. Uh, Stephen... 
You saw Joel writes, uh, hey, John, just saw La La Land and it was fantastic. I know it's doing well, but I'm surprised about the low theater count. Any chance of a wider release in January? Yeah, as long as they keep doing well in the limited release, they keep rolling it out more and more and more into more theaters. Certainly a good chance that it could get an even wider release uh, come January. Uh, Sinan Hughes writes, when will Movie Talk be back on? Movie Talk comes back tomorrow on Monday. Movie Talk is back. We have been off because of the, the Christmas vacation, but Movie Talk makes its triumphant return tomorrow. Um, Andrew Romanella writes, where do you see Collider five years from now? You know what? That's a good question. Um, especially because YouTube is becoming more and more of a question mark. Um, there's really no money to be made in YouTube. There really isn't. And it's difficult to, because a lot of people think, oh, if you make a video that has a million views, you've made like $100,000. No, 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 no. Roughly speaking, there's some a little bit higher, some a little bit lower, but roughly speaking, if you make a video that gets a million views, and not a lot of people do, if you make a video that gets a million views, you'll make anywhere between $1,000 to $1,500. $1,000 $1, to $1,500. If you make a video that gets 100,000 views, you've probably made anywhere between 100 to 150 bucks. So like an, an average episode of Movie Talk, it's about 100,000 views, right? Guess what? It costs us a whole lot more money than that to put together an episode of Movie Talk. Certainly a whole lot more than 100 to $150. Um, and it's becoming more and more restrictive. You've been seeing more and more that, that, that a lot of the bigger YouTubers have been complaining about YouTube a lot lately. And I mean, we have started making shows for other people. And, you know, we did Film HQ for Comic-Con HQ. We're now doing the new uh, show Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns. We're doing for Collider Go 90. I think what you'll probably see in the future is us making more programming for non-YouTube outlets. Um, number one, because the money is much better. Uh, number two, doing stuff with YouTube is becoming more and more problematic, but who knows? I mean, YouTube tomorrow could institute a whole bunch of new guidelines and a whole bunch of new rules and fix a whole bunch of things that makes YouTube a lot better. So who, it's hard to say where we're going to be as of right now, if things stay the way they are, uh, where do I see Collider Video in the next five years is probably doing more and more non-YouTube programming. Uh, but you know, who knows? Any, things can change overnight. So let's just keep our eyes open. Uh, Jimmy Saud writes, any favorite books on film or film history? I've been me and Christian both have been talking about this book called How Star Wars Conquered the Universe. Um, check it out. It's really insightful. It's, it's not just because of Star Wars, but it gives some great behind the scenes stuff into the world of Hollywood. Check that book out. It's amazing. Uh, Gian Gittens writes, if George Lucas fought Kathleen Kennedy in a Star Wars schmodown, who wins? George Lucas. He's the creator. Like you say, George Lucas, you're wrong. Well, actually I'm George Lucas and I say this, so therefore it's right. I mean, so George Lucas wins. I mean, Kathleen Kennedy would do great, but I mean, it's against George Lucas. So come on. Uh, Eric Manning writes, a movie and or movie scene that you did not like at first viewing, but came to love it afterwards. Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. I do not know why, but I hated that movie the first time I saw it. Hated it. Didn't just dislike it. I hated Inglorious Bastards. Then I watched it again, like five months later. I'm like, what the hell was wrong with me? Like, what? Like, was I in a bad mood that day that I saw it the first time? This movie's awesome. So I, that's the one movie that really stands out to me uh, that does that. It's crazy. Um, Styros Charalambides, sorry, man, uh, writes... Will Awesome Tacular be on the Collider channel? No, the new Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns will not be on the Collider YouTube channel. It will be on Verizon Go 90. It is a free network. You don't have to sign up for it. It's not a pay per view network as far as I know right now. Uh, you just look it up online, get the app, whatever. They have a lot of great programming on there already. It will be on the Verizon Go 90 network. Okay, just a couple more quick ones and I got to wrap this up. Uh, thoughts on Hacksaw Ridge. It was my favorite movie this year. Well, I just put out my top 10 films of 2016 and Hacksaw Ridge was number one. It is my, I think, the best movie of the year. Um, Joe 
Kogleman writes, what's your favorite reality show? Mine is the curse of Oakland Island on History Channel. My favorite reality show, if you count it as a reality show, is The Ultimate Fighter. That's my favorite reality show. Caleb Dune writes, Boba Fett standalone movie gaming some momentum. Time to accept it's coming eventually and think it will be announced at Celebration? I don't think so, actually. It's, it's certainly possible. I, I'm not going to fall over for shock if it is, but I don't think it is. Um, Darren Kane writes, over or under 50%, what chance will it be that we'll see one of these four characters in Avengers Infinity War? Mr. Fantastic, The Thing, Silver Surfer, Galactus. Under 50%. The rights to all those characters still lie with Fox and they've already started shooting the movie, the, the new uh, Infinity War. So 0% chance that we're going to see those characters uh, in that movie. Um, Eric Anthony Rodriguez writes, you guys need to do an animated Transformers the movie commentary. No, we don't. I don't even like the movie. That movie pisses me off. The first 10 minutes are great, but all that movie was, that Transformers animated film, that was a giant middle finger that Hasbro, gave, and I love Hasbro, but at the time, these were the people in charge 20 years ago, was a giant middle finger to all the kids and all the people who love the Transformers because what did they do? 10 minutes in the movie, they killed off all the characters. They killed them all and say, ha ha, hey kids, you know all that time and money you spent falling in love with these characters we've given you and the toys you bought? Well, F you, We're, they're all dead now. Now here's all the new toys you have to, here's all new characters and you have to buy all the new ones now. I, I hated it then when I was younger and I still hate it now. Um, so yeah, I will never do a commentary to the Transformers animated movie because it still pisses me off to this day that they did that. Um, oh... Okay, guys, that's it. I, I'm, I'm out of time. I got to wrap this thing up. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for putting up for the no production value, bad audio, bad video, and just me sitting here raffling off as many of these as I can. I really appreciate your patience with me. Hey, guys, don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you click that little bell. If you Even if you're a subscriber already, click that bell symbol beside the subscription button to make sure you actually get notified when we put up brand new content. I really appreciate it. And don't forget, Movie Talk comes back tomorrow. We're back, the full crew. Everybody's back from vacation. And we are looking forward to seeing you then. Uh, you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campy. I make a lot of announcements and everything on my social media. So make sure you're following me there. And... I hope you guys all had a wonderful Christmas season, a wonderful and safe New Year's, and we're looking forward to hanging out with you guys in 2017. We got a lot of cool things planned that we're excited about, and we're just really looking forward to hearing from you and having you participate with us. So thank you so much. That'll do it for us. My name's John Campia, and until tomorrow, bye-bye.